from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. West Virginia University, online at wvu.edu. The High Technology Foundation, headquartered at the I-79 Technology Park in Fairmont, online at wvhtf.org. At the legislature today, the pros and cons of consuming raw milk is debated in the House. Senate Bill 30 passed overwhelmingly and heads back to the Senate to consider House changes to the bill. In the Senate, there's more discussion about funding for state roads and another agreement for more study of the issue. And we begin a two-part series about ginseng. Could it become a leading cash crop? These stories and more coming up on the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Ashton Mara. The charter schools bill passed the Senate early last week. The final vote was along party lines, 18 for, 16 against. After consideration by the House Education Committee, Senate Bill 14 is now before the House Finance Committee, which held a public hearing on the charter schools bill this morning. Beth Voorhees reports. The speakers were pretty evenly split, for or against establishing charter schools in West Virginia. Wendy Peters, a third grade teacher in Raleigh County, resents that charter schools will have access to funding by the school building authority. We have buildings in my county that are over 100 years old in desperate needs of repair. Taking money from public schools and giving them to charter schools will only make it harder for us to make these much needed improvements. Tega McGuffin, a teacher at Oak Hill High School in Fayette County, dislikes what she sees as the exclusive nature of a charter school. You know, there's some words being thrown around in this debate that I would really like to focus on, choice and alternative. The premise of choice in a free market is that everyone has access to a good and that they are actually able to purchase it or not. Well, let's talk about choice within the charter school movement. The idea that charter schools provide choice is really just a public relations move to garner support for the system. Is there truly parent choice involved when we're talking about a lottery for admittance? Is there truly choice involved for our LGBT students? It's not in this bill. How can we look at a certain group of kids and tell them that they are not worthy enough for admittance? Or how can we look at a certain group of kids and say, you don't have a choice, only certain people have a choice. Guys, that is not choice. That is exclusivity. There's a difference there. But choice is exactly what Charles Minima of Charleston wants. The failed system leads desperate families down the wrong path. Why advocate for charter schools? The answer is results. The public school system has failed us and it's not working. A charter school initiative can help change that. And so does Reverend Matthew Watts, the senior pastor at Grace Bible Church in Charleston. For the last 30 years, I've spent as much time as I possibly could trying to be an advocate to support public education because I believe that I owe a debt to the public school system uh, that produced my brothers and my sisters and myself. And I've spent probably as much time up here at the legislature for the last 20 years as any private citizen advocating to try to change the public school system. I do not believe the public school system have been a great failure. I believe they've been an incredible success. And they've been so successful, they've produced the greatest economy, and they really have almost antiquated themselves, and they now are unable to keep up with the pace of the demands of the society and the economy. Senate Bill 14 to establish charter schools will be considered by the House Finance Committee and will likely end up on the House floor very soon, with just four days left in the legislative session. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Beth Voorhees. Senate Bill 14 was one of the first to be introduced this legislative session and is a priority bill for Republican lawmakers. As the bill was worked in the Senate Education Committee, stakeholders at the Department of Education as well as union representatives watched the bill closely as it was molded from a 20-something to 50-something page law. 
One union leader who participated in the process is Dale Lee. He's the president of the West Virginia Education Association. Dale, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Let's start with the public hearing this morning. You were one of the first speakers. What was the point that you wanted lawmakers to hear about this charter schools bill? Well, actually two points is one is there's no accountability in the bill. They talk about that has to be accountability in their in their charter, but all of our schools are under a OEPA and, and the OEPA or the Office of Educational Performance are, uh, can take over a school or school system as they have in the past when there's financial problems. But yet we don't think that is important that our charter schools should report a financial statement or should be under the OEPA. If all they have to do is submit a financial statement, Enron submitted a financial statement for years and that didn't work out too well. So one of the things that we were asking is that they be under the OEPA because most charter schools get in trouble with fraud and mismanagement of funds and we want to make sure that doesn't happen here in West Virginia. The second one is the, is the choice with the lottery system and, and trying to ensure that this, the county or the area's demographics for the students are part of that charter school. In other words, we, we want to ensure that every child in West Virginia has a quality education, not a select few, not a hand-picked few, as you heard in many of the discussions this morning. But if it works for a small group of kids, then we need to be able to transfer that for all of our students in West Virginia. I think if we can go a little bit more basic than that even, I think some people have problem with the idea of access. They don't understand the difference in access from a public charter school and a regular public school. Can you explain that? Well, for one thing, in a, in a charter school, it's uh, in the bill that's being talked about, it talks about they may or may not contract with transportation. So it actually doesn't even have to provide transportation for the charter school. That eliminates access to students who only way to get to school is by a school bus. If the charter school doesn't have the, the bus runs and doesn't provide the transportation, then you're eliminating access. Whereas our public schools, access is to all students. And we make sure that we have a way to get all students to the public school, and that's not in this bill as it's presently being discussed. The Senate Finance Committee is taking up a bill tomorrow to allow the alternative certification of teachers. That bill has changed a little bit in the Senate, and you say it's a little bit better. Can you tell us about those changes? It is a little bit better in that it is uh, uh, now talking about that alternative certified people will have to take either six coursework hours or six staff development hours in the certain areas that it lists in the bill. But all of that really is just camouflage in the fact that our problem is we don't have, we don't pay a competitive salary to retain and keep our teachers in West Virginia. We made a promise last year to get salaries competitive by making the beginning salary to 43000 by 2019. And yet almost every delegate and senator has gotten up on the floor and talked about the need to get salaries to a competitive level. But we have many bills that were introduced this year, some sponsored even by leadership that can't even get on a committee. So this is all, a, to me, a, a way of deflecting the problem that we have, which is trying to keep quality teachers in West Virginia and putting the focus somewhere else so that we're not really focusing on the main problem. The alternative certification is one bill that's progressed. There are other bills that were talked about. Teach for America is one of them. To try to get teachers into these high priority areas, these critical need areas like McDowell County, where they have trouble getting teachers coming and staying there. Is the answer to getting those teachers their pay or can we do anything else to get teachers into these hard hit counties without these other programs? Uh, the answer is not only pay, you have to make the salaries a competitive wage, but you have to also give the respect back to the profession that it once had. When, when we tell people all the time how bad our system is, and I, I really take offense to that because I travel the state, and I see great public schools in West Virginia, I see great teachers all across the state working with students and bringing out the best in them, but many times there's their hands are tied. As I travel across the state, over and over, teachers tell me, give me the chance to teach. Just let me teach. Instead of teaching a test-driven curriculum like we have, 
Let me teach what my kids need to know. Let me take them where I need, where they need to go. Thank you very much for your time, Dale Lee, with the West Virginia Education Association. Thank you so much for having me. Senate Bill 30 permits shared animal ownership agreements to consume raw milk. Currently in the state, it is illegal to purchase or sell raw milk. And just like when it was debated in the Senate, some members of the House today also questioned the health effects of drinking raw milk, while others maintained it allows for personal freedom. Liz McCormick reports. Senate Bill 30 would allow two parties to have a written agreement, saying they would share ownership of a milk-producing animal, and that milk would be used for consumption. The bill would also require the Department of Agriculture to be aware of the agreement, and the seller would have to meet state standards from a licensed veterinarian. If an illness would occur after consuming raw milk, those persons in the agreement would have to report the illness to their local health department. Debate erupted on the House floor as health risks and freedoms were discussed. Delegate Nancy Guthrie of Kanawha County opposed the bill because she worried it would reintroduce diseases like polio and others. When I look at this bill and I realize that we could have taken one more preventative measure by just saying to the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Health and Human Services, while we recognize that agriculture is in a growing industry in our state, we need to be very careful about maybe reintroducing E. coli, maybe reintroducing polio, maybe reintroducing some of the diseases that have been associated with non-pasteurized milk over the years. Let them have joint custody on writing the rules. Delegate Jim Morgan of Cabell County says he used to own a dairy farm and questioned the cleanliness of those parties selling raw milk. That was a difficult job, keeping that sterilized, clean, and the Kanawha Charleston Health Department examined our farm every two weeks. I just don't understand why somebody who maybe thinks that a nice cow giving milk is going to be better than buying it pasteurized off the shelf. If you have seen farming conditions other than the ones under the subject to health department rules, and I understand there's some rules in this. I feel that it's a step backwards in public health and that for those conditions to be met is going to be very difficult. And when you go to the farm to visit your cows, be sure to look at their udder and be sure it's clean. Delegate Lynn Arvon of Raleigh County supported the bill and argued it would not require retailers to sell raw milk, only two consenting parties with an animal that produced milk. And I think people need to remember this bill is not about selling raw milk. This is about people owning their own cows, their own goats, and using the milk from those cows and goats. I think they have the right to use those animals as they choose. We talk about freedom, that is freedom. We're not selling it to anyone else, although personally I think they should be able to do that. If people want to buy raw milk, they should be able to buy raw milk. And I'll use the example I spoke about in health committee. Alcohol. How many deaths can we relate to alcohol? I can't even count. How about to raw milk? I know one in 25 years. So are we going to ban alcohol? I think not. Delegate Kelly Sabonia of Cabell County also supported the bill and says there are more deaths related to foodborne illnesses than from raw milk. There are 10 million people in America that consume raw milk. 10 million people. We haven't heard a big problem that people are out there dying, but yet there are millions and millions of foodborne illnesses in America due to cantaloupe. Um, 300 people were hospitalized for, for candied apples. We haven't outlawed candy apples for the consumption of children. Seven people died in 2015 from candied apples, and 300 were sickened. Delegate Matthew Roback of Cabell County says he will support the bill, but only because he thinks it's an attempt to regulate something that has the potential to be harmful. I think we have to be realistic that Raw milk is being sold, and we're not regulating it. I think this bill is an attempt to regulate a cottage industry that is going on. 
and if it does get some oversight over the herds, begrudgingly I can support this bill. But I'm going to rise to tell the members that we're going to have some tough debates this week about some issues of public health. And the people of this state depend on 100 people sitting here to make decisions for their health and well-being, and I urge you not to go backwards. Senate Bill 30 passed 81 to 19. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Liz McCormick in the House. Funding for roads was again the focus of a Senate committee meeting this morning. It's too late in the session for senators to approve a bill that would increase dollars committed to the state road fund, but members on both sides of the aisle say they are prepared to commit to a study of the issue. In the 23 years that I've been a senator, um, the biggest issue <clears throat> in the last two or three, four or five years that I get from constituents is, is our road issues. Senator Bob Plymel of Wayne County introduced Senate Bill 478 nearly a month ago. The bill proposes increasing revenues for road construction by upping the gasoline and consumer sales taxes and raising division of motor vehicle fees that haven't been touched since the 1970s. Plymel told members of the Senate Transportation Committee the bill takes some of the unofficial recommendations from Governor Tomlin's Blue Ribbon Commission on Highways and incorporates them into code. What this bill does it lays out everything that was discussed and somewhat approved. Not a final approval was done by the Blue Ribbon Commission. I was a member of that along with Senator Hall and Senator Beach. Um, so we did come out with a comprehensive plan. What is missing from that is the tolling aspect. If we don't keep the tolls on and allow that that money to be spent on new construction on King Coal Highway, the Coalfield Expressway, within a 75 mile radius of the, the turnpike, we're not going to continue to have a commerce that we need. Plymouth says neighboring Ohio leveraged their turnpike to fund road projects across the state, and Virginia and Maryland have used a blanket 1% sales tax increase to increase revenue for their highways. Mike Clouser with the Contractors Association of West Virginia told the committee a study by his organization shows if the state would increase highway spending by $500 million, it would create 10,000 jobs, not just in construction, but across a variety of industries in West Virginia. These states are realizing that Washington is not going to solve our problems, that if it's going to be done, it's going to have to be done on a state level. Why do we want to do this from a road standpoint? It's the economy. Roads, the transportation system in our state is the economy of our state. If you cannot transport your goods, if you cannot be able to do uh, the drilling equipment on Marcella Shell, and uh, you know, you can go on and on and on and on. Transportation Chair Senator Chris Walter says it's too late in the session for both chambers to approve Plymouth's bill, but he's working to craft a resolution to commit the legislature to study road funding for a year. On the floor, senators discussed a resolution passed this week by the Finance Committee. Senate Concurrent Resolution 13 urges Congress to pass a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution. The resolution calls on Congress to call a convention of the states to consider the amendment. Earlier in the session, Ohio Governor John Kasich met with West Virginia lawmakers, urging their support for the amendment. Kasich is also a possible 2016 Republican presidential candidate. Monday, members of the Senate Finance Committee approved the resolution, but a Democratic member of the chamber, Senator Herb Snyder, wanted more consideration before it was put to a final vote, moving the resolution be committed to the Senate Judiciary Committee for its consideration. Clearly, this is a judiciary issue. I'd like to hear from some constitutional scholars to explain some of the unanswered questions. My concern is the ramifications of unintended consequences here. Some of those unintended consequences, according to opponents of the measure, include being unable to limit the agenda and authority of a convention of states. Both Democratic and Republican members of the Senate supported the motion, though, including Minority Leader Jeff Kessler. And while uh, we all were frustrated with what happens in Washington, 
to think that maybe perhaps over in Washington we'd be sending folks to go over and rewrite our entire Constitution causes me great pause without having the full realm of knowledge and background as to how it would work, why it would work, how it could be limited, if it could not be limited. Because I am concerned that uh, as I look around the, the, the nation and the states and the politicians in D.C., I know the folks that wrote the first Constitution, you know, and I look around over there and I see no Thomas Jeffersons. I see no Ben Franklins, Alexander Hamiltons, Jane Madisons, or others. Finance Chair Mike Hall says he understands the concerns of calling a convention of the states for the first time, but says something needs to be done to control the nation's growing debt. Washington cannot fix itself. And there are those voices out there that begin to say to us, maybe we need to reach back in the oldest document that founded our country to a provision, Article 5, and say the states will need at a certain point to address what the federal government is doing. And that's what this is, whether symbolic or actual. The public, by an overwhelming majority, supports this concept. Maybe the process could end up being frightening to some, but I think we need to listen to our public who are telling us we're afraid of what's happening in Washington. The motion was approved to send the resolution to the Senate Judiciary Committee. 34 states would need to pass similar resolutions to hold the convention. As many as 25 states have approved the measure, but the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy says some of those states have rescinded their support. A resolution in the West Virginia legislature only needs approval by a simple majority vote of both houses to be adopted. It does not need a signature from the governor. The war on coal, pressures from natural gas development, crumbling infrastructure. Whatever you want to blame it on, jobs are becoming more and more scarce these days in communities dependent on coal. As a result, some folks are reaching back to their roots, literally and figuratively, to make ends meet, just as they have for generations. And there's some big money there, especially harvesting ginseng. But can plants like ginseng play a significant role in our economy today? It's a question Glennis Board tackled in this, the first of two reports. The top five counties last year were Mingo, Wyoming, Logan, Randolph, and McDowell. All Robin Black is West Virginia Division of Forestry's ginseng coordinator. For over 25 years, her role has been to monitor the ginseng industry. She says last year, over 7,000 pounds were harvested. At last year's average price of $750 a pound, five and a half million dollars came into the state. The miners use that ginseng that they harvest during the season to help pay bills, give them a Christmas, and that kind of stuff. So in the southern coal fields, yeah, that's a big extra money that they can get during a small time period. But can ginseng play a more significant role in our economy? To answer that question, we have to understand some of the driving economic factors, the most important being that the most valuable roots in the world are those that grow in Appalachian forests. Ecologist and Eberly Professor of Biology at West Virginia University, Jim McGraw, has been studying the plant for decades. Wild plants tend to grow really slowly and their whole life history is very slow, so it takes a long time for them to even get big enough to produce a single seed. See wild saying, that is the good stuff. That's the route that Asian markets will pay top dollar for, just as it has for the past 300 years. But ginseng can also be planted and cultivated. Um, in the opposite extreme, with extreme cultivation, like happens in Wisconsin and Ontario, um, plants grow very quickly to adult size, and two to three years, and you can have plants producing seeds and be quite large. The thing is, you can really tell when sang has been cultivated. The root is all swollen, fat, white, and smooth, compared to wild sang, which is scrawny, tortured, and dark. But some mountain folk have found that planting the seed in a more natural or wild setting produces a root that will fetch a more competitive price. But these forest grown plants where people are actually planting seeds in the woods, they tend to be a little bit more like wild, but it depends what they do to them. So if they prepare the ground, for example, with a tiller and they plant in a tilled area, those plants will grow faster because they've eliminated competition from other neighboring herbs and so forth. So depending on the growing techniques, this forest grown ginseng crop could be a game changer according to industry experts, academics, and others involved with ginseng. 
Larry Harding is one example of someone who's made a comfortable living forest growing. He shows off one of his forest grown roots. There's not a there's not a person on earth who could say that's that's not wild ginseng. Yeah. But it's not wild ginseng. <laughs> we planted that ginseng. So, you know, that's ginseng that we planted here on the farm. Harding's father started his ginseng farm 50 years ago, just outside of Friendsville, Maryland. That's just over the West Virginia border. Now, the laws are a little different in Maryland, but Harding says each year he harvests anywhere from 500 to 2,000 pounds of dry ginseng from the over 80 acres of his steep forested land. It's enough to provide Harding's main source of income. And the price he can get for his forest-grown root compared to wild root? The difference in price um, when you're talking about root like this, little to none. You know, so, the, the, you know, this is, this is wild quality root. Harding markets his product as having wild characteristics, taste, color, and texture. He says it's the quality of this forest-grown sang that fetches funds comparable to that of wild sang. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Clintus Board in Morgantown. Tomorrow we'll hear more about how ginseng is regulated and what critics say needs to change before a ginseng industry can thrive in the state. This has been the Legislature Today. I'm Ashton Mara. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. West Virginia University, online at wvu.edu. The High Technology Foundation, headquartered at the I-79 Technology Park in Fairmont, online at wvhtf.org.